Lino has uh, one good case to dovetail on uh, Alex's talk, and then uh, we'll wrap up. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> a few cases I put together, and I will uh, try to go through them pretty quickly so I don't keep, keep you all from lunch. Perfect. Okay, so first case is a 19-year-old presenting with back and bilateral leg pain. Uh, do we have any trainees here or no? Trainees, trainees, no. Okay, so I'll be the trainee. So this patient's presenting with an ismic spondylolisthesis. We, SIG gave us a great talk on dysplastic. Um, really, this patient doesn't have any significant dysplastic features, but um, does have back and leg pain and uh, low-grade spondylolisthesis. So at this point, she's exhausted non-operative treatment and... Um, she is interested in surgery. So what, uh, maybe I'll just kind of go clockwise. What, what, what's your approach, Lee? You said she's having leg pain. Yeah, back and leg pain. Up to 50-50 or do you play? 50-50 and bilateral parts fracture and a grade one spondy. Yeah, I think so. Let me see. So CT scan here. So supine reduces, you know, to a grade one. Certainly, I don't think it was even a grade two standing. And then let me see if I have MRI. <clears throat> you know, on the MRI, by the one's already degenerative a bit. Um, for the foramen, there's definitely up down stenosis. And um, these, I, I don't think you can get a good depression without uh, restoring the disc and the pyramidal height. In my hand, this is just a MST lift at 5 1, really restore the height, and really chop off the facet, and completely visualize the uh, exiting nerve root, um, and it uh, should have a good result. And right. also, you know, back to Alex's uh, talk, I mean, so 4 5 5 1, total lordosis is about, you know, 35, 40 degrees, and nowadays with the expandable cage, each cage can give you 20 to you know, 22 degrees even. So if you times two, I, I think if you do like adequate release and uh, this, you know, young person with good bone, you can even improve the lordosis at this level just with a, a T lift. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So sh her PI is sort of in the mid range. I think it's around 60 degrees. Um, her lumbar lordosis is 45 and 39 degrees from four to one. So. You know, the I agree that she's someone that needs at least um, to maintain the lordosis. She has a five one, if not in, increase it a little bit. But um, I think some of our higher PI patients, where we want to have more uh, lordosis at five one, maybe a T lift is in Lee's hands. I think very doable, and I think generalized. But yeah, it's hard to generalize that you can get a lot of lordosis with a T lift uh, widely. What about you, Ishar? Yeah, I, I think I agree with Lee in, in my hands for something like this. I, I actually do, even though I do uh, MIST lifts, I, I like <coughs> doing these open. So I do a gill laminectomy mm -hmm. and um, a bilateral um, approach into the disc space. And I do use the expandable cages and I think reliably um, with bilateral expandable cages, uh, we could get 25 degrees out of the um, uh, at that level, I do leverage the, um, uh, the bed as well. I think that's been very helpful. So, um, you know, I put the patient in a little bit of a kyphotic position on a pro axis table uh -huh. where I do my discectomy and then, um, I put uh, short expandable cages right in the front. Um, and, um, uh, with, uh, putting the bed in lordosis, um, I get, get all reduced. the lordosis just through the positioning at that point, uh, with a very, uh, wide release posteriorly. Yeah. Um, and, um, um, and I don't do any compression on the screws because, you know, you have single level fixation and I don't want to loosen that up, but, you know, young, uh, young male, good bone. So, 
Uh, yeah, it would be a one level posterior open with bilateral plif type cages in my hands. Uh, this, this patient, sorry, is a female, but yes, yeah, I think that's a it's a really good point uh, when you're thinking about approach. Is you know young male patients um, for those who do a lot of a lift for uh, spondylolisthesis, you need to discuss the risks of retrograde ejaculation. Bobby, what would you do? This is a chip shot. <laughs> we, we had just do an a lift. And yeah. then perk them in the back. Right, right. And See? that patient. Yeah, so I, I wanted to uh, I thought I um, advocate for circumferential fusion here. I don't think everybody would. I think uh, one potential solution here could certainly be a uh, posterior fusion without anything in the body space. I think that'd be a very legitimate, perhaps even cost-effective thing to do. My my advocacy for circumferential fusions, and I think I could. <clears throat> better maintenance of lordosis and maybe even to some extent improvement of lordosis uh, and better fusion with the circumferential fusion. But I, I want to point out that I think a posterolateral fusion is a very reasonable uh, option here. And certainly in our degenerative spinal anesthesis population, we don't have evidence that uh, adding the inner body makes a big difference. Uh, I don't have good data uh, on this for, for the isthmic population. Yeah. Uh, having said that, uh, in, in my hands, uh, this is one where, as much as I love the T lift, um, I, I get a more reliable fusion with an A lift here. Uh, so I'm going to do an A lift at 5 1, uh, really try and create lordosis. You know, right now that, that alignment from 5 to 1 is probably a little bit less than I want it to be. So if this person is, uh, you said, public instance of 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. About so, 60. Yeah, you know, probably a Rousselet 3 then, right? Is I'd probably want to have the apex of uh, their lordosis, um, you know, maybe at the four or five level. I I'd like to do an A-lift at five, one for reliability fusion. And then um, rather than perk this in the back, in my hands, again, um, you know, I know you get a good reduction with an A-lift, uh, at least an eight millimeter posterior height is what I shoot for. But I'm also going to do that gill procedure. And not only the gill procedure, but I'm going to take off, I'm going to skeletonize that pedicle of L5. So specifically, that nubbin of pars where there's callus and where there's um, uh, uh, you know, some impingement on the L5 root, I'm going to directly decompress that. Yeah. Um, again, so I, you're sort of talking about this. Yeah, that right, that right, right, right up there. in there. Or, or, yeah, I guess that's, so when you, when you take off yeah. uh, and do the gill procedure, you take off the posterior elements of 5, that comes off very easily. You know, once you take down the inner spinal segment of 5-1, I just lift that off in one piece. It gives you a great bone graft. Um, but there's always some callus left, and I think there's enough of an incidence of some degree of postoperative radiculopathy um, that, to me, directly visualizing that decompression, uh, you know, probably takes me an extra hour compared to just perking it in the back. But, but to me, I, I'm, I'm doing that as an open decompression. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it sounds like we have various approaches. We have a lift, open decompression, open screws. We have a lift, perk screws. We have uh, T lift and MIS T lift. I think Sig, you brought up the idea of perhaps doing a just a posterior lateral fusion without inner body. I think the only only issue is you're relying on intertransverse fusion for the most part with that, and so I think could work, but less reliable than maybe doing an inner body. But uh, anybody else do something different? So, so kind of make a comment. Yeah. The the um, I used to do it with a gill, but then there was this paper by Gene Carrigy and Todd Alleman over at Stanford that compared gill laminectomies with basically both just post, you know, posterior fusion. Yeah. And the patient who had the gill laminectomies didn't do as well. They had more pain. Interesting. Uh, and, I find, and from the standpoint of instrumentation, when you're opening it up posteriorly, um, that level is really hard to get a good angulation on your screws with a midline incision. You actually have to expand, expose quite a bit or really you know, get retract lateral. the muscles. Yeah. And, if, and I've never figured out a, the, the trick or the pearl of how to get those screws in in a good position. Because sometimes, it's, sometimes the pedicles of L5 are a little bit small and dysplastic and your angle, you know, it's, it's, it can be hard. So SIG, if what are your thoughts on that? It, teach me something. You know, it's funny that I think um, your four or five degenerative spondy or your five one where you're just fusing a single segment from midline 
you're absolutely right. That upper instant vertebra, you really got to get out lateral on that. And, and I, you know, I, I am releasing the fascia probably up to L4 here to get out to the tips of the transverse processes. I, I have had situations where I've done a midline decompression and still put in the L5 screws through a separate fascial incision. Yeah. So that's something that, that can be useful. But no question, your hand is really being pushed medially by the iliac crest, by the fascia. And that's why sometimes, you know, a T10S1 is actually so much quicker to instrument than a single level because that upper instrument of vertebra, your hand's always being pu pushed medially. And I almost always do, so from a practical point of view, I almost always put in the UIV screw, be it L4 or L5, on both sides and then let the trainee put in the, the lower screw because I've already taken off the facet joint. But that lateral towards medial can really be, be challenging. And sometimes the separate fashion incision is a lot easier. For sure, I, I agree, it's challenging. It requires a wider exposure, for sure. So I would ask you for those of you who go post here, do you, um, do you use BMP? And I know BMP is kind of making a different swing here. Um, I mean, for this procedure or just in general, for, the, for those of you relying on the posterior fusion? So I, I use BMP in just about all my A-lifts. I think that's where the, the okay. evidence is best. Um, and I probably need it less <laughs> in an A-lift than I do in a posterior <laughs> lateral. Uh, you know, I think right now the evidence for BMP posterior laterally that, you know, the Louisville group showed that at the higher concentrations, mm -hmm. so 20 mg per cc, that that, um, or 20 mg total, that, that that's probably effective posterior laterally, but I, you know, there's evidence for seroma, the Yoda data is saying that the difference between local bone, see if, I, if I'm doing this posteriorly, I get a lot of bone grafts because I take off that whole L5, so I get a lot of local bone. So the, the long answer to your short question is I don't tend to use BMP in my T-lifts, nor in my posterior lateral uh, fusions, but I use it a lot anteriorly. Yeah. Well, what we did on this one was sort of what Bobby described an A-lift and then use percutaneous screws, you can kind of get a sense for that medial to lateral or lateral to medial trajectory with the, uh, the perk screws. I have, you know, probably a series of maybe 30 or 40 of these that have done this approach in, in pediatric and adult patients. And I have had to go back on, I think two or three to go back and do a gill laminectomy for, uh, you know, ongoing back pain, not leg pain, but back pain. So I think that unhealed, you know, if you, if there are times where I actually see the uh, gill fragment heal, but there's times that it doesn't and it stays sort of a source of pain and, and that typically resolves with the gill. Yeah. When I go posterior and do a direct uh, decompression, that <coughs> pars defect has a lot of soft tissue around it. And, um, so I, I was just going to ask you, in, in your experience, when the patients have uh, radiculopathy because of that foraminal stenosis and you do an indirect decompression, you haven't really had the experience that um, it doesn't work, right? So every time you do the indirect decompression, the radiculopathy improves. Correct. Yeah. The, I think it comes down to the technique and the cage planning with ALIS. So getting enough posterior height that you're really increased slowly increasing the foraminal height and the posterior disc height before you dial in that lower doses. I think the times that, um, you know, I think one of the risk factors for having a post-op L5 radiculopathy would be a lordotic cage that doesn't provide that posterior height and that clearance over the nerve root. I think when you go through the front, you have a, you have a wide exposure of that posterior lateral disc space. Yeah. And when you're doing a gill and you're trying to chase that nerve root down, where when you reduce, what happens is either that little osteophyte on the under, at the very lower corner of L5, in this particular case, if there is mm -hmm. an osteophyte there, sometimes traction spur will, will, will pull on the nerve. So, um, or, or the disc gets crowded into the nerve and pushes on the nerve. Yeah. So when we're going lateral on the gill, we, we're, that's what we're doing. But in the anterior approach, you can actually see that. Yeah, you can and see you it, totally and when you press it all the exactly. way around, the yeah. I mean, you so, could take out the. Yeah. Do you do you take out the uh, posterior disc annulus and PLL? Um, I don't take the PLL uh -huh. typically because it gives me something to pull against. Some ligament oh, ataxis, yeah. yeah. But I go posterior lateral and yeah. take out all the discs yeah. until you can almost see the nerve. Yeah, I do the same thing. I thin out everything until the very last layer of the of the annulus. So. Yeah. Then when you prop it up, everything gets sucked in. And there's a little hook underneath that little, little, 
little curvy little hook underneath the L5 vertebra. Yeah, yeah. that far closer. Are you talking about this or yeah, are you talking about on the parts? Uh, yeah, there. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little, you know, where yeah. it is that kind of stretch out. Yeah. Can you get that? Can cure it. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Metz. Yeah. Yes. Are there any considerations for you to try a direct PARS repair on a 19 year old or any of your pediatric patients? You know, maybe they do have a little bit of radiculopathy, but uh, you know, they're gymnasts and um, they need to do their backflips and tumbling and they're yeah. college bound. Uh, are there every, I, I mean, I, I remember, you know, Keith Bridwell did uh, one uh, direct PARS repair when, when we were fellows. Um, any considerations for you to, to do a direct heart repair on a patient like this? Maybe yeah. their symptoms are a little bit less, even though they failed non-surgical treatment. So I do do PARS repairs. My, my indications are sort of um, patients that are, like you said, young, have minimal or no spondylolisthesis, no disc degeneration, and no foraminal stenosis. So the, I think the reasons, you know, that, that I didn't choose that for her, or didn't uh, guide her that way, is the Primal stenosis and disc degeneration, primarily. All right, I'll keep going. This is uh, case two, so sort of continuing on SIG's theme of dysplastic spondylolisthesis. I don't know if this is showing up very well, but this is a 12-year-old, or 11 or 12-year-old uh, girl who presented with back pain and uh, bilateral radiculopathy, L5 radiculopathy. Uh, you can see that she has both a... Uh, high-grade spondylolisthesis, high-grade dysplastic spondy, and then um, an associated sciatic scoliosis. Uh, let's see, initial treatment. We should, who are we? Dr. Tuckman. Tupin. Um, yeah, I don't do much peds anymore, or any. Um, but, um, I mean, obviously, uh, piggybacking on SIG's talk, uh, this kind of is a spinal deformity, not just a, a high-grade spondylolisthesis in terms of alignment parameters at this point. Um, so uh, from a surgical standpoint, I think some element of reduction would be huge for a case like this. Um, you know, I will tell you, I see a lot of x-rays um, in our indications conference from Dave Skaggs, who does a lot of the transdiscal screws at um, S1 into the L5 body, kind of a modified Bowman technique. And um, why I, I'm very surprised in these younger patients how much correction they get on the table um, and then just sort of locking them basically, I assume, in the correction that he's gotten on the table with an L4 to S1 posterior lateral fusion. Mm -hmm. uh, they're young, they tend to heal, and I haven't seen a bunch of uh, failures coming back to the indications conference. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm very surprised, actually, in, in terms of like how often like L4 is sort of flat, yeah. the alignment looks so much better. So, you know, for a case like this, I think that might be a good option. So I think you bring up a great point. So this is a patient with dysplastic. I think she does have fractures or discontinuity of the PARS, but she's young, so biology's on our side. Um, and, you know, our, a lot of our PEDS colleagues are not doing interbody or interbody work, right? So, Dr. Javadon, can you, do you think you can get this patient reduced and fused without doing any interbody work? Or do you think inner body is a necessity here? I would probably um, do some inner body work at uh, uh, five one, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that would definitely help you in its reduction. Maybe a partial reduction in just positioning and a posterior release. Um, but again, my tendency would be to do inner body work. Um, at the 5-1 level and um, sometimes when that sacrum is dome shaped mm -hmm. um, or there's an anterior lip of L5 preventing you from um, pulling the uh, L5 back, um, I uh, tend to uh, use the technique that Dr. Bourbon showed with a, a cob or a, a some sort of uh, um, 
<clears throat> instrument to cantilever and pull the L5 back. And I think in uh, some cases you might have to even consider um, getting more uh, level fi like fixation into the um, pelvis uh, with uh, you know iliac bolts, not necessarily in this case, but um, or uh, even going up to L4. But obviously try to avoid that. But I would say I would lean towards doing interdiscal work or even small osteotomy at the lip of L5 or the sacral dome to pull that back. Got it. So so we're leaning towards doing something in the disc space. Then our options at F5 one are going to be T lift, probably open T lift versus any anybody doing a lift here uh, uh, she's 11 11. yeah yeah th th this is a uh, environment that's very favorable for healing i think a single stage posterior um i'm sure if you look at a supine x-ray this is going to reduce partially um the, the only thing i'd add to the conversation uh, on this is, is again, I, I like this from the back. I think the issues with healing aren't uh, as much of a concern here. Um, I like reducing the slip angle. And in this case, uh, you will certainly get it a less than grade one. I like an inner body with the T lift. The only thing I'd add is I'm gonna also give her pelvic fixation because I think that this has a lot of strain on the S1 screws. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so she would get pelvic fixation in my hands. So is that for you, do you cross SI joint or do you do more iliac, uh, iliac bolts? Yeah, it's, <coughs> it's an interesting evolution. And I think right now the advantage of the S2AI fixation uh, crossing the SI joint is that um, it's a lower profile, there's less implant breakage. Uh, and then it brings up the question in an 11 year old, would you maybe even think about fusing the SI joint using, uh, you know, we've seen that the bedrock system here. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's still an evolution for me, but I'd probably cross the SI joint. I'm not sure I'd necessarily um, put two points of fixation to fuse the SI joint, but I think I'd at least get fixation across the SI joint. Mm -hmm. Bobby, are you thinking anterior or posterior? Looking at the CT, you can actually get to this disc space from the front. <laughs> but but I, I actually am old school. I, I agree with Sig. For a young, pers young person like that, the, the key elements or the key goals are to shorten the spine a little bit, to allow the reduction of the slip angle, which is the most important thing to reduce, to decrease the lumbosacral kyphus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you fixation is dealer's choice, depending upon how much correction you're able to achieve and, the, and where that L5 ends up. And there, there's multiple ways of, of achieving a fusion in the inner body space. Like with a, uh, once you get the slip angle corrected, you can maintain that with either a Bowman type technique. If you don't have, if, you, if it's still fairly slip forward, but the angle is corrected and you don't have enough space for a cage, or if you have enough space for a cage, it'd be nice to put a cage in. And then the question is, you know, if you don't have good fixation at five, because as a young person, five pedicles might be dysplastic, you might have to go to four, uh, and and whether or not you uh, fuse four or five is one thing, or just instrument mm -hmm. and, uh, and and then take later. them out a little bit later. Yeah. Um, so uh, you have a lot of options. I think this is one of those things where intraoperative judgment plays a very huge role in um, in surgical success. Yeah. Well, so this is someone. I think this is probably the the most you know, difficult access a lift that I've attempted, but I did choose to do an a lift on her just to avoid the morbidity of going to the pelvis or going up to L4 was sort of the, the thought. Um, she did reduce on the table. So I put a sacral, a towel under the sacrum, which sort of gives a little bit of, a, uh, um, you know, it helps L5 reduce just a little bit more. So before incision, she had reduced to like, you know, a little bit more than a grade two, probably. Um, the anterior lip, I think, as someone mentioned, is is kind of blocking your access to the disc, so you have to remove that with a osteotome before doing your disc work. And then this is sort of, you know, a little bit cringe here. You have a cage that's arguably, you know, in the spinal canal prior to the, the rest of the reduction. Sig showed a great case where he reduced L5 onto S1 by 
putting two screws up into L5 and then using kind of a direct um, uh, reduction technique before putting his screw down into to S1. I do it a little differently. I put two screws down into S1 to sort of form a stable platform and then reliably in hyperlordotic positioning you can get the L5 to reduce. So this is after the anterior and then this is after the, this is perch screws again, so I didn't do a gill laminectomy or any sort of uh, midline approach, just put in perch screws, have a unbelievable amount of um, power to get reduction here. I've had several that have over reduced actually. Um, and then use the, the rod. So you kind of almost like a fishing pole, you lean back on the rod and it, and it kind of creates a, uh, a, uh, some leverage to reduce L5 on S1. So this was the result. And again, the, the asymmetry is because when you're putting in screws with navigation, you're putting them where the anatomy is. The anatomy is not symmetric, so things will look asymmetric quite a bit. Um, and that's her at six months. So w one, one approach, anyhow. Criticisms or thoughts about that? Wow, that's a great result. Um, when you were describing the anterior of this space and putting siding the cage, did you undersize a little bit so it's a little looser and you can reduce it either from the back or how do you gauge this? I find sometimes if you over distract, and, you know, um, it may be harder and you have know, more resistance, but how do you decide to drop it the So I guess my, my technical pearls for the A lift portion would be I actually will over distract, so I'll put in. I'll trial a little bit larger than I actually implant. And that just makes sure that, you know, circumferentially things are very mobile and, and, uh, and release. And then I use a, you want to use a lordotic implant to kind of help with the reduction in the slip angle. Um, unfortunately, you know, when you do take down the anterior lip, that's kyphogenic as opposed to taking bone posteriorly, like a sacral dome or off of L5 is going to be lordogenic. So that's one one place that you lose some of your lordosis in, uh, in the correction. But I think it's necessary to really be able to get access and, and visualization of the posterior uh, disc space. But then it's just a matter of, I think, the positioning after that, and it should slide right now. Even before you place the screws, it, it usually is reduced to probably a grade one and a half or so. So anyway, that is the approach there. And the scoliosis seemed to have mostly resolved as well. Let's see, how are people doing? We have time for one more or is it time to wrap it up? One more, this one's a weird one, so. All right, 67 year old male, formerly incarcerated, uh, presents with back pain, stiffness, buttock pain, no claudication symptoms or radiculopathy. Um, this is just a, look at his lower lumbar spine. I'll show the rest of the films later, but lordosis um, of 20 degrees, but from three to one, it's really completely flat with a high pelvic incidence of 70 degrees. So this is his um, standing scoli x-rays. Shoot, I skipped forward a little bit too much. Okay, uh, standing scoli x-rays. So I have a CT in here that I'll show shortly, but he is auto-fused from um, L3 to L5, he has a very dense bridging uh, posterior fusion. Disc space is open. So, Dr. Tuckman, what would you do here? Um, yeah, I mean, I think a case like this, um, <clears throat> I think if it, if it looks like a very robust fusion in the back, I would probably go from the back first, open it up, and then um, plan probably just an L3 to S1 fusion in a case like this would be my going in plan. 67 sounds like if he's formally incarcerated, probably some medical comorbidities going on here, but tough one. You have to have a conversation about the possibility that you may end up coming back and doing a larger surgery down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of times it takes a conversation to kind of understand sort of what's best for the patient. Certainly you can 
try a staged approach, like do the posterior, do the anteriors, get upright x-rays and see a lot of the guys who do multi-level laterals will do that. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel, I feel like I can usually sort of get the correction I know I'm going to get and lock it in place, even with a smaller surgery though. So. And when you say go, so you're saying you'd approach the back first and then go to the front. And then a place tip, like probably like a, you know, maybe even a 20 degree graft at L5 S1 and then Mm -hmm. 15s at L4, 5 and L3, 4. Uh, and then go back in through the back at the same day and close down the posterior column osteotomies. Um, cause it, it, and it looks like probably the rest of the spine will, it's hard to predict what the rest of the spine will do after you do that though. Right. That's always the hard part. Uh, Irene, uh, back is more stiffness, stiffness and inability to stand up straight. He had a remarkable amount of kind of stoicism towards pain. Didn't really complain. Spinal deformity, yeah, sagittal plane deformity. Irene? I would almost uh, flip the script on you, Alex, because you're at Cedars and, you know, being, let's take away the fact, let's pretend he wasn't formerly incarcerated and he's, you know, 62, plays a lot of golf, likes to travel, has the same, you know, kind of scan. I think um, probably a lot of people in your, you know, I trained in, in Southern California. I mean, you, dr- you make the Kool-Aid, then you drink it. And so um, I think in this, you probably are, there are going to be a lot of people who might offer him like a multi-level, you know, lateral instead of going to the post year because, you know, the one mm. is the recovery faster or better. And so I guess to see if these, these disc spaces are mobile, um, but if he truly fused on that CT scan, I mean, it's just so hard to, um, to see if, if the multi-level inner body is going to work. Yeah. Uh, and obviously we have Neil Anand and some other people with the multi-level mm-hmm. laterals who do get good sagittal plane correction in my hands, at least for sagittal correction. Yeah. I just find the A-lifts are so much more predictable and we have great, it's tough cause we have great approach surgeons. So getting mm-hmm. L3, 4 and L4, 5 is like not that big of a deal. Right. Yeah. But some places it is. <laughs> so I think it's interesting conceptually. Lee, Lee showed a case yesterday of a uh, cervical case where the facets were autofused posteriorly. I think the mechanical environment here is different in that it's such a robust fusion mass that he has from uh, three to five that I don't think you can overcome that and get segmental lordosis without taking it down first. At least I didn't think I could. So um, anyway, so what we did... This is, let me see if we have a good look at the posterior lateral fusion. It's not fair, you didn't show me that MRI. So, what was that? I said, that's not fair, you didn't show me that MRI. Yeah. Severe stenosis above. Yeah, so he did have a little bit of stenosis. Um, so, did a three level A lift after taking down the posterior fusion from three to five. Um, this is his sort of interstage x ray. And then the following day did a, a prone transoas. Let's see here. Prone, prone transoas above that. So that was at two, three, and then a T10 to pelvis. So this is sort of the final result here. Looks so, great. I, I would say that the relatively harmonious correction is not, I don't think it's perfect. I don't think the, uh, you know, it looks like the apex should be probably a little bit lower, but yeah, maybe for if he's a Rusli four, maybe that's about right. But Sig, what do you think of the the harmony? Would you do a PSO here, or what what would your approach be? You know, I, I think uh, can you go back to the preoperative CT because I think um, preops when we think about mis- mismatch, um, sometimes the standing films really overestimate. The mismatch, and uh, uh, in this case, this was, as you indicated, a pretty rigid deformity. Um, I often say that when I see a vacuum sign, that to me is an invitation to uh, to do something in anybody space. So, yeah. you know, certainly the uh, the a lift uh, at five one, and as you did uh, three to one a lifts. You know, oftentimes um, this was not an instrumented fusion posteriorly; it was just a and it's uh, a spontaneous auto, fusion. Auto fusion, yeah. And a lot of times you can kind of overcome that. So, um, you know, with, with an A-lift three to one, which which you did, I, I agree with that. With doing that, I, I probably would not have started posteriorly. So you did posterior facet first, right? 
Then Aleph, so it's yeah, back, front, so back. Cut across the fusion mat. This, this I, unfortunately, I don't have the pair of sagittal cuts that show how robust, but it was basically like a femur you know, on both gutters. And I, I had, you know, looked at this extensively and did not think I could get segmental correction without taking that down first. So that's why I went posterior first. Yeah, uh, so we've done L3D S1 anteriorly, T10 S1 posteriorly, and I, I like your distributional lordosis on this. You know, I think by really doing a good job from four to one there, um, yeah, I, I think you had a great distribution of, of lordosis on that. And uh, I think that that's a nicer distribution than I might have gotten with an L4 PSO. Um, and, and probably a better better healing rates, less complications, less, less complications, yeah. So. All right, one more quick one, or should we call it? What do you think? All right, it's pretty good. Right. You know, it's interesting, because I think, interestingly, I think Dr. Tan operated on this gentleman's partner, and they had the same cervical kyphosis. Um, so I don't know if, the, if myopathy or whatever was causing this is something that's transmissible, but maybe. <laughs> but anyway, so this is a gentleman in his late 60s presenting with uh, difficulty with horizontal gaze and uh, chin on chest deformity. Uh, this is up close. So, Irene, what's your read here? So standing films and then a close up of the neck here. Um, just seeing that x-ray alone almost makes me think, does he have any kind of neuromuscular, um, you know, any kind of issues yeah. um, or any previous surgery, previous lammies, things like that. It really does look like his chin is pretty dropped closely to his, to his chest. So I think some of the questions that we would, you know, kind of naturally ask if, does he have any swallowing problems, nutritional issues? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'd ask if he had any surgery or any neuromuscular. Yeah. So... I, unfortunately, I did not send a muscle biopsy for him, but, you know, my sense is that he probably does have a primary myopathy of some kind. Uh, he does not have any contractures in the anterior neck, has no history of any spine surgery whatsoever, um, and no known kind of cause for this. But uh, And is it flexible, you know, is it flexible or not? It's, it's not completely rigid, but it's not cor passively correctable. So lying supine, his head is still up off the table. Still. Yeah. So Lee, we, we heard a lot about sternocleidomastoid releases. Have you done that at all, or is that something you would consider here, or just? Yeah, you know, I, I have not had to do that. Uh, it's fun, like you know, when you help you release the bony um, during the front, uh, typically you can get uh, enough correction. Um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, you're right there. If, uh, if it's the soft tissue and muscle is tight, you can sort of just uh, sack that. Mm -hmm. Um, readily, um, but you know, looking at the X-ray, yeah, the hypothesis is really concentrated at four five, and some at five six and six seven. Also, four five may be fused. You may have to do you know, up to the fuse this space and the uh, onset, and, uh, and then, you know, maybe even go down to T one. Um, How's the T one slope? Who's relative to normal? Uh, relatively, let's see, relatively. Normal, I'd say it's probably in 30, 25 degree, yeah. So, yeah, so he, you know, we talked about earlier about sort of, we get kind of this best case scenario view when we get these standing x-rays. So he actually clinically had a thoracic kyphosis as well. So I think it was, it was a cervical thoracic, or a, a cervical kyphosis as well as a thoracic sort of postural kyphosis related to his myopathy as well that doesn't really it's not appreciated fully here but um so this was something that i discussed with him i thought he would probably need a fusion from c2 down to the lower thoracic spine or even to the upper lumbar spine but um decided to do it in a staged fashion so first um i don't have interrupts so first just addressed uh the, I didn't take down the autofuse level at four or five. I just did a ACDF from um, five to one, I believe. And then um, posterior fusion C2 to T5. 
So not a beautiful x-ray. I think it's, it's, uh, he's still a little bit flat. I think I should have gotten probably 10 or 15 degrees more, um, lower doses in the lower cervical spine, but sort of stage one, anyhow. During his recovery, he had some additional reciprocal kyphosis and, um, and clinically he looked, he looked worse as we were approaching his second stage. And interestingly, he got into a car accident I think a week or two before his uh, elective second stage and fractured um, T5. So he had a true distal junctional failure um, in addition to uh, the, the reciprocal changes. So this was him um, right before second stage and then extended him down to uh, L3. So it's interesting how much, again, that reciprocal change that you see from three to one, he had probably, I don't know, 40 degrees of, kite, of lower doses there before, and now he's flattened that out. So we'll see if he, sort of the reverse of what we usually see when we start at four or five and end up at C2, it's kind of coming down, but hopefully you can avoid a fusion to the pelvis anyhow. Anyway, that's it. Anybody do something different or thoughts? These are super tough. I, I, granted, I've only done like a couple of these of these kinds of cases in kind of the early part of my practice, but I think the like if you like you said, it's usually we start from the bottom and come up, but this yeah. is like the opposite of yeah. you know. And I feel like the next slide I thought you're going to show me is you know to the occiput or <laughs> you know or to the pelvis, which can happen. Yeah. I think it was super smart of you to make sure to check for that 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 kind of. Uh, that cervical cervical deformity is not perhaps a response to, um, you know, a deformity lower down, yeah. um, and so I guess my question. So you you went anterior first, right? Multiple, yeah. Okay. Perfect. ACDF. Yeah. yeah. Posterior. I mean, I've done. I, I think if one of the points is your your distal stopping point on these cases. I've done a couple of cervical thoracic deformities that really were thoracic deformities where you know you try to try to extrapolate like you know, um, last touch and using like Sherman's kyphosis principles. Mm -hmm. And I just don't, I feel like they don't apply in the same way to adults, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Like yeah. I have, uh, off the top of my head, two, two distal failures where I used the Sherman's kyphosis criteria in an adult mm -hmm. and like, um, you know, initial x-rays look great. I was super happy, you know, and then they fractured, you know, pretty early on afterwards so yeah. i think that's it's really hard i don't know if you use something different do you just go beyond do you, yeah. do you just go into the lumbar spine right off the bat both were salvaged by going into the lumbar spine and not to the pelvis but yeah. i don't know so for, yeah his stable sagittal vertebra is probably what l1 or l2 um but he had severe disgeneration between two and three so that's what brought me down to three no I, I, no, I was just uh, going to agree with Alex. Um, you know, I, I had a very similar case with a myopathy with a semi-flexible head drop. And um, we ended up going to the neutral zone, which was like T11. Mm -hmm. And immediately post-op, uh, I got a compression fracture under T11. Still, yeah. And then we had to extend it two levels down. And uh, thankfully, that held up for six years. Mm -hmm. And then we had severe degeneration of L3-4, and then I did a T-lift for him. Uh, so now he's down to L3 mm -hmm. and um, um, complaining of some back pain. And my fear is that, um, you know, he's only like 55, 60. So he's going to probably be going to the pelvis. And um, it is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not looking forward to that. So yeah. these are sometimes no-win situations. I don't know. Maybe Bobby has a pearl to avoid all of this. I've gone the all the other way around from the lumbar spine, constantly up, mm -hmm. and every level that I did not operate on ended up falling over. Yeah, and uh, because of their myopathy, and there's no treatment for the myopathy. Yeah, and there, I had a question: uh, Why did you decide not to do C four five? Because that was uh, a fairly kyphotic level. I I agree. I just. Uh, I think that's probably the most kyphotic level. And I just, it was fused front and back. So I think I would have 
you know, needed to drill out the unsnits and then perhaps gotten some correction there, but yeah. just didn't, didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because when, when I see some of these things and, and they're, they're elderly, they're a little bit sicker and I, I try to talk to them about stages and yeah. trying to do something that would help them to some degree because they don't need a perfect correction. They just need to look up a little yeah. bit more and they're usually pretty happy. Yeah. So if they're, the sets are fused in the back, I would probably do an osteotomize in the back. They go into the front and if they're fused in the front, I would probably consider osteotomizing them in the front if I could, with the goal of trying to keep the fusion segment short. But if they have a myopathy, then you're kind of stuck. You might as well go to a stable level and hope yeah. that doesn't break down, right? Yeah. So short segments may not work so well in the patient who has a global muscular imbalance uh, problem. So you, you, you've taken care of these as well quite a bit. It's just the gift that keeps on giving a little bit more so than spinal deformity surgery. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I think um, you know, one of the subtleties that's interesting here, Lionel, is if you look at the preoperative standing, it, it's interesting because this myelogram, it looks like there's some flexibility in the thoracic spine. But if you look at a preoperative standing film, the patient's clearly got a, a SVA that's, that's high. Um, maybe nine centimeters or more, C2 SVA. Um, and, and the thoracic spine isn't really compensating. So what I mean right. by that right. is that yeah. you would expect a thoracic hypokyphosis. And we defined hypokyphosis as less than 30 degrees in our PJK paper. If you were to measure from T3 to T12 here, I'm gonna guess that that's still in a range of 50 degrees. 50s, yeah. Which, yeah. which may be normal, but it's certainly not normal for somebody with this degree of sagittal plane deformity. And, and to that end, that's where I think that this is you know, obviously a problem in the subaxial spine, but there's also the fact that they're not compensating in that thoracic spine, to some extent, I think this was kind of predictable that you'd have to go down into the, into the lumbar spine because I think the fact that that thoracic curve doesn't correct to less than 30 degrees kyphosis means that there's a structural part of that curve in the thoracic spine as well. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. One, one additional comment, Lionel. I, I find, you know, sometimes doing these, uh, the positioning uh, of the patient is actually pretty tricky sometimes because, you know, I know you and I, we, you still use garden wells or you mm -hmm. switch over to the... No, I'm I use garden yeah. wells, yeah. So, um, you know, like sometimes when you position the patient on the flexion rope and, you know, their head dips a little bit, you know, during the sort of... Uh, uh, exposure stage, and then you know you want to improve the venous return. You like reverse T the table, mm -hmm. and intraoperatively sometimes I thought, well, you know, I got a pretty good correction. Now the the back of the occiput is sort of even with the uh, the the kyphosis of the thoracic apex of the thoracic spine. But then what happens? Uh, their butt is actually way down because the reverse T. Mm -hmm. uh, what I found is actually I learned this from uh, Chris Ames is that like draw a line from the occiput and then the uh, the apex of the thoracic spine and then the buttocks. Those three lines, if you can do it flat, then you know their head is gonna be, um, when they stand up, they're, they're gonna have a good sagittal uh, correction. Because intraoperatively, it's, it can be pretty hard to, to see, depends on like how the table is angled. Yeah. You know? um, but yeah, I, I agree with uh, um, Sig that you know, like it's probably just the poor protoplasm and uh, myopathy, you know, sarcopenia, all those uh, things, you know, it's either if you do the lumbar spine, you're gonna keep on marching up to C1 and mm -hmm. maybe occiput, but if they have myopathy first, you're gonna march towards the sacrum. Um, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's tough, yeah. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>